Content warning. Sex, adultery, cannibalism, bleeped out profanity, and existential despair. Action, excitement, horror, romance, thrills and chills, swords and sorcery, rockets and ray guns, a dizzying canopy of the strange and impossible from the darkest depths of the human imagination. What mad universe encompasses such tales as these? Join us as we bear witness to the sweeping sprawl of all the history that never was and all the futures that could yet be. It's adventure as you like it on What What Mad Universe. I only wish Kilgore Trout were here, said Elliot, so I could shake his hand and tell him that he is the greatest writer alive today. I have just been told that he could not come because he could not afford to leave his job. And what job does society give its greatest profit? Elliot choked up, and for a few moments he couldn't make himself name Trout's job. They have made him a stock clerk in a trading stamp redemption center in Hyannis. Kilgore Trout was born in 1907, or possibly 1917, in Bermuda. His father worked for the Royal Ornithological Society and was charged with watching over the Bermuda urn, a bird that eventually went extinct. Trout's father killed his mother, or else they both died of illness shortly after he graduated from high school. Trout became a science fiction writer, writing thousands of short stories and novels, including The Gospel from Outer Space and Oh Say Can You Smell? But for most of these, he was paid doodly squat, and his stories were used mostly to fill space in pornographic magazines. He lived in poverty, working menial jobs to pay the rent until 1973, when he had an encounter with God. God's name was Kurt Vonnegut, and he revealed to Trout that he was a fictional character, the star of many of Vonnegut's novels, including God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater and Breakfast of Champions. Kilgore Trout died in a writer's colony in 1986, or possibly 2004? Having finally found some success with his novels, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine, and acclaimed a hero. So it goes. And yet, despite being fictional, Kilgore Trout has had a book published. A real book. A book which appeared on the shelves of bookstores in our world, credited to Kilgore Trout. That book is Venus on the Half Shell, and strictly speaking, it has three authors. One is Trout, one is Kurt Vonnegut, and the third is Philip Jose Farmer, a writer who spent his life blurring the lines between different fictional worlds and the real world that we live in. And welcome to a very metafictional episode of What Mad Universe. I'm Adam Prosser. With me, as always, is Philip Rice. Hello. Hello. So today we're talking about a really oddball little curio called um, uh, Venus on the Half Shell, which, as I say, is a book that uh, is kind of a... Uh, liminal book it it was written as a joke in the it it exists as a fictional novel within the book god bless you mr rosewater by kurt vonnegut credited to kilgore trout and there is a passage from the book which is uh, pl- uh cited in the novel and uh so philip jose farmer took that segment and decided to write the entire novel around it and credit it to kilgore trout as a joke so this is a pretty weird phenomenon. I don't know if you can say this has ever happened before exactly. Um, I don't think so. No. <laughs> there's. I'm trying to think of examples where something vaguely similar might have happened. Um, the closest I can think of is Michael, Sh- uh, Michael Chabon's novel, The Amazing, Adventure of Cav- Ma- Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, uh, where it was about a pair of uh, fan- fictional comics books creators who wrote a comic called The Escapist in the 40s. And um, eventually they did make a comic book called uh, The Escapist. Oh, okay. Well, that sort of thing happens. Like uh, 
the Jay and Silent. I don't know why this came to me, but the Jay and Silent Bob <laughs> superhero comic. That's that right. In the movies, yeah. they actually made that. I think. Right. Actually, now that I think about it, uh, Buzz Lightyear got his own actual oh, yeah, uh, cartoon was, show that eventually. Was the Buzz Lightyear, but not where he wasn't a toy. It was actually a space ranger. Right. It was the it was the cartoon show that the character would have been based on in the <laughs> in the. So I guess this does happen, but it's it's weird that it it's still a weird. Uh, example of it yeah it's it's it, it was really taking it to a new levels because as i say it was actually it came out initially uh credited to kill Trout, not mm-hmm. uh not even to any of the authors so we should discuss the story of how this got made because it was legal it wasn't like a bootleg <laughs> thing right um so uh do you want to take it or no you, you okay. go ahead so uh from what i read from and this is all from farmer's perspective so mm-hmm. uh it could be slanted i'm not sure right um he uh, uh, contact. He he tried to contact Vonnegut a few times through the mail and wasn't able to. Finally, he got his phone number mm-hmm. and called him and uh, asked him. And Vonnegut gave his tepid approval. Mm-hmm. Um, so he just sort of yeah sure whatever. <laughs> um, so uh, um, I think he was a little more enthusiastic. Like I wasn't maybe not enthusiastic, but he was. He he thought it was a bit of an entertaining oh, joke okay. at first. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, the feeling I got, and it might just be how you read Farmer's words, but I I got the impression it was kind of tepid. But yeah. Um, so uh, uh, Farmer went away and wrote the wrote the book. Uh, he apparently uh, had 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 writer's block before that. He was having trouble writing his own stuff, and this sort of cleared that up. He wrote mm-hmm. this in six weeks. Right. Oh. Um, and um, it was published under the name Kilgore Trout. Farmer's name was nowhere on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there were all these theories going around about who actually wrote it. Right. A lot of people were saying it was Vonnegut himself. Um, and uh, Farmer said a lot of people were writing to Vonnegut saying, this is your worst novel or this is your best, <laughs> best novel. novel yeah. I don't know which one would be more insulting. <laughs> uh-huh. um, well, I guess worse. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's kind of insulting either way. But anyway. Um, but uh, what pissed Vonnegut off was... Uh, his uh one of farmer's friends who knew that farmer had wrote it uh sorry what was the friend's name um leslie fielder yeah leslie fielder um had gone on william f buckley's talk show Mm -hmm. uh and he was discussing uh uh vonnegut and uh he mentioned this book and said that the author of it uh would have written it whether vonnegut gave his approval or not Right. Um, which apparently wasn't true. Well, he actually went even further. He said he would yeah. have gone and changed his name legally to Kilgore Trode if yeah. he had to to get the novel written, yeah. which was obviously a joke. Yeah. <laughs> that was not true at all. But, but. all this pissed Vonnegut off because, mm-hmm. uh, uh, um, well, obviously. Mm-hmm. So uh, Vonnegut actually vetoed uh, the um, possible sequel that would have been written, mm-hmm. uh, which was... Uh, Sorry, uh, The Son of Jimmy Valentine, which was another uh, a Kilgore Trout novel mentioned in a Vonnegut uh, book. And uh, there was apparently going to be an animated movie uh, with music by the Grateful Dead. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. Uh, well, yeah, well, it would have been interesting. Uh-huh. But Vonnegut said he would sue. Right. Or threatened to sue. I don't know if, like, yeah. uh, Farmer had the film rights, but right. still, he didn't want to have that hassle. Yeah. I think at that point, Kurt Vonnegut probably had at least a fair amount of legal uh, right to not to not have it made into a movie. Yeah. Um, whether he, you know, the book is a different thing, but uh, so that uh, unfortunately, and and Philip Jose Farmer had actually planned a whole bunch of different projects uh, in which he and other people would yeah, he write stories. Philip K. Dick and some other people. Yeah, yeah, would be supposedly credited to fictional characters. So. Uh, he and uh, there's a character we'll talk about the novel shortly, but in Venus and a Half Shell, there is a fictional author called uh, uh, Jonathan Swift Summers the third, the third uh, who kind of who actually occupies basically the same role that Kilgore Trout does in mm-hmm. Conniget, Kurt Vonnegut's novels, in that he's a well liked science fiction writer by the main character who keeps, keeps thinking of his stories in his novels and cites them as you know oh th- this is like a story that Jonathan Swift Summers had done once. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of the same. So he was going to write a story that Jonathan Swift Summers had oh, written. Oh, he actually did write two Oh, of, yeah, that's right, uh, he did. He wrote uh, two of the, um, Ralph von Valvau, who is a, <laughs> yeah. um, a, uh, dog, uh, who was, uh, Gen- you know, genetically altered, so he could uh, talk and was super intelligent with a 200 IQ. Right. And he became a detective and right. a 
crime fighter and uh-huh. see he's sort of like a Sherlock Holmes stand in. Right. The um there's some extra material in uh in the book uh mm-hmm. that was published uh, a, a biography of Somers himself. Right. Um that farmer wrote. And uh uh yeah, the the there, there's a long description of all the yeah. different Vau Vau stories. He said he did like 18 Wow Von Vau Vau novels. Yeah, and he eventually goes into space and... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it, so so basically, we're, we're what? five? It's inception, It's narrative inception here. Yeah. We're five or six layers deep into yeah. which, which story is fiction, a fictional story contained within a fictional story. But yeah, he apparently did write those two... Uh, those two Two of those stories, and he was yeah. going to write a third, but never got around to it. Yeah, and apparently there were some other people who wrote uh, stories as other fictional characters, most of them I hadn't heard of. But there is a really interesting one, which was that, because uh, Philip Jose Farmer was friends with Philip K. Dick, and uh, he said uh, he had recruited Dick to write a story uh, credited to Hawthorne Abdenson. And Haw- Hawthorne Abdenson is a writer, the titular character from Phil K. Duke's book, The Man in the High Castle, uh, which is about a writer in an alternate reality who writes a book about another reality, which might be our own, although may also not be. Um, and anyway, that never came into being, but that's really interesting to me. He would have written uh, one of the stories that Hawthorne Abdenson wrote, which were crucial to the plot mm-hmm. of The Man in the High and, Castle. Um- uh, once again, uh, Farmer said uh, he went to uh, the original writers, even the ones whose stories were in the public domain, right. to ask for permission. Yes. And some of them turned him down, so he, right. he wasn't going to do those. So mm-hmm. that that adds sort of credence to his his yeah. version of events about the Vonnegut thing. Right. Yeah. I think I I don't think it, it, I mean he's a huge fan of Kurt Vonnegut. He was not writing this to in any way mock or belittle mm-hmm. uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Um, I should just uh, mention, I should talk about Philip Jose Farmer here at this point, uh, because he is kind of interesting. He's, uh, well, he's actually, he's not that interesting in terms of his life. Uh, he was born in Indiana in 1918. Uh, he was, he, you know, he worked various menial jobs, but he always wanted to be a science fiction writer. Uh, his second story, I believe, was Riders of the Purple Wage, which was published in Dangerous Visions in 1967, um, and won a Hugo. And it was, uh... It's very weird. It's a very strange story. He has a... He, uh, the, the Dangerous Visions anthology, which I'd like to talk about in a future show, actually, uh, was what was the pivotal for what was called uh, the um, uh, the new wave of science fiction in the 60s. Uh, all the stories in that are written in a very, uh, tr- I, I want to say trippy style. Uh, it's, it's sort of beatnik poetry in right. some ways. Yeah, like it's, it's sort of uh, would randomly insert, uh, it's sort of all over the place in terms of the... Um, uh, who's speaking, and mm-hmm. uh, sometimes it would just randomly put in a sentence that's a complete non sequitur or something. Right. Yeah, it obviously has some thematic reason, but I couldn't make head or tail of some of it. Yeah, well, it's a post-Beatnik, uh, like, basically it was bringing, the, you know, literature with Jack Kerouac and uh, William S. Burroughs had kind of been transformed as, as a much more, uh, you know, stream of consciousness crazy uh, m- much less rigid style, and uh, Harlan Ellison created Dangerous Visions partly to sort of get that style into science fiction because science fiction was very nuts and bolts, uh, you know, pragmatic, rational. Oh, it's all about the quote realism unquote, uh, and that was a series of very strange, uh, trippy stories that were often cutting edge. So it was trying to be kind of what literature at the time was doing mm-hmm. in the context of science fiction. Uh, actually, the sequel eventually featured a story by Kurt Vonnegut as well, okay. uh, called I believe the the great space f- <laughs> uh, and um but uh anyway so farmer had a story called rise of the purple wage anyway so that was uh, one of his honestly one of his early stories and ellison really uh um what's the word indulged uh farmer uh, very strongly uh into going into writing and since that won the hugo that kind of got him on board so farmer seems to have been really into the idea of uh working with other people's uh, stories and trying oh, to well even that even that story mentions Pellucidar and Barsoom and right other, Purple other Wage you mean. yeah Purple yeah, Wage yeah. exactly yeah no yeah he's always and he, he, Farmer's probably best known these days for creating what's known as the Wold Newton universe which I'm sure we'll be discussing in a future episode but we need to cover some other things first I think right yes yeah it was his attempt to sort of uh, it, it's kind of a proto version of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen yeah. which we 
keep mentioning on this show, but it was uh, it was sort of his earlier version of uh, tying in the genealogies of all these famous adventure characters, Sherlock Holmes, Doc Savage, Tarzan, uh, revealing that they all had their uh, origins. And I believe he was saying they were all part of the same family, yep. if you go back far enough. Um, and there, I believe it was a, a meteor strike in it, medieval England. Yeah, that, it, uh, it caused the family to become irradiated, and right. be, that's what makes them special. Right. So... Uh, uh, so he created this giant cosmology, and it was a uh, uh, two novels, I believe, that really fleshed it out. One was called Tarzan Alive, and the other one was called Doc Savage: His Apocalyptic Life. He also wrote the Secret Log of Phileas Fogg. Oh yeah, the other log of Phileas Fogg. Or, yeah, yeah sorry, Fogg. yeah, where yeah. he's an alien or something. Yeah, it's the, all but all the stuff that was left out of uh, Around the World in yeah. eighty days. Which yeah. uh, once again, you know, we talked about in the Saturn and Ferrando episode. I wonder if they yeah. mash up at all. Yeah, it would be that would be interesting for sure. So anyway, there's a whole uh, braft of literature, but this is what Farmer and Farmer's a talented writer uh, himself as well. I I believe, but he's clearly he's he really likes to riff on other people's work. So that's what oh, he what also he was wrote doing uh, an Oz story, a story set in Oz. Right, yeah, he he's, he wrote a I'm, uh, he wrote pastiches of a, a whole bunch yeah. of different writers, especially at this particular period when he was writing Venus in a Half Shell. So anyway, Venus in a Half Shell uh, is Phil. Do you want to describe the plot of Venus in a Half Shell? Um, okay, <laughs> uh, it's about the last man, the last human male in the universe, mm-hmm. uh, who has to travel from planet to planet uh, to learn the answer to the question of life the universe and everything yeah. which ultimately turns out to be disappointing right sound familiar yes <laughs> that's right uh, when you read this and as many many people have observed it's uh, very hard to uh, get away from the fact that it uh, reads a lot like uh, the, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy uh, or at least the, the basic premises are the same mm. the feel is quite different yeah um, there is a, and uh, Adams was compared to Vonnegut a lot back in the day uh, as well um, because Adams would have all have the same little parenthetical digressions where he'd have a little mini story. Uh, in Adam's case, it was always in the uh, the actual Hitchhiker's Guide would have an entry on something, and it would mm-hmm. be basically a mini humorous short story, and he'd go back to it. Whereas with uh, Vonnegut, it would be a story by Kilgore Trout. And in Venus on a Half Shell, it's usually a short story by Jonathan Swift Summers uh, that provide these little parentheticals. But it is, yeah, it's the, the last human on Earth. Earth gets... Uh, sterilized by aliens yeah it gets uh flooded actually right and uh so uh the main character uh who is uh he was just called the space wanderer in the original vonnegut text but here he gets a name simon uh, wagstaff simon wagstaff yes which is apparently one of the uh names that jonathan swift went by okay uh one of his uh oh. uh pen names oh that's kind of cool the original jonathan yeah swift. oh well, that's and of course the initials are SW, same as Space yeah. Wanderer. Yeah. So that's he has a big a SW neat... on his shirt. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of clever. I, I didn't yeah. realize he, he was working on that many levels when he named him that. But yeah, so he goes around and it and it's very much Farmer working in what I would describe as Vonnegut style or an attempt sort at of. Style. Uh, he doesn't use the same because Vonnegut uses very short sentence like declarative sentences. Right. And it, uh, Farmer in the uh, in the foreword that I read said he intentionally didn't try to do that because it's it's. Kilgore Trout writing, not Vonnegut. Right, yes. But it is obviously very Vonnegut in its themes. Mm-hmm. Um, like, it's very deterministic, mm-hmm. uh, as, uh, say, um, Slaughterhouse-Five is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's absurdist. It's absurdist. And uh, um, uh, Farmer himself said that uh, he believed in free will and all that, so he was sort of working from the opposite of his own opinions on some things. Right, yeah. He was moving he was working in someone else's uh 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 mode. His yeah. the, but it, it's um yeah, it's got the same thing that Vonnegut does where there'll be like some enormous tragedy and it'll be played off as absurd. Mm-hmm. Uh you know, the human race gets wiped out by aliens who want to uh uh, clean it up basically they yeah. they literally flood it with water so it'll be what was their motivation again it was all the perverts coming out of earth was something like no that? no that was something else um there were a lot of perverts coming out of earth <laughs> but no it was because of um uh it was just i think it was environmental things right he was just yeah that's right they just kept wrecking their environment so he'd wash them out and then they'd yeah so they'd a few million years they'd go back to uh, yeah. basics but and, uh they they appear towards the end of the story and they've 
they've given up all that and they apologize to him. Right. Because he's the he ho- hoon whores, they're called yeah. the aliens who do that. Yeah. Um, and he's, uh, he, 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 um, he survives, Simon survives by, because they were in Egypt when it happened and a mummy case containing, uh, uh, the, the, the Pharaoh, the biblical Pharaoh, uh, pops up out of, uh, out of the water and he's able to grab a lift with a dog, uh, who, who he names Anubis, who he names Anubis and who eats the mummy to survive, uh, until they land on Mount Ararat. And of course that's reenacting the flood and everything. Um, he does get a spaceship from a, a guy who's shown up, uh, who's shown up back on Earth after having been away for a few hundred years, and only Ooh. wants to know the outcome of the what was it twenty twenty six seventy four World Series? Yeah, <laughs> which ended in scandal, so there was no winner. Yes, exactly. And he kills himself because of that. Yeah, <laughs> because he's so depressed. Which is, of course, foreshadowing the whole. You don't, you don't really want to hear the answers because they'll depress mm-hmm. you. Basically, that's the theme of the novel. And then anyway, so then he goes off and he has a series of adventures in different planets, which are, you know, little Swiftian parables about all the, the, the weird... Yeah, uh, he, become, he drinks an immortality elixir. That's an important plot point. Yeah. Because he's immortal. So he, he actually lives through like thousands of years in this in this right. book. Right. Yeah. He In one planet, it's a, a planet where uh, everyone's immortal and everyone contains their ancestors within their own cells so their ancestors are always fighting to take control of their body basically yeah everyone... and the answer ans- they've they've developed a uh, system where the ancestor gets a day every like century or something yeah so they spend all their time just having sex yeah and they have to they have to work during the day but they they work as much as they have to because that's how the system because the so- society would fall apart otherwise right but then they spend all their night drinking and fucking <laughs> right um but uh, yeah, no, and and there's a bunch of but he the main uh, thrust of it, as it were, uh, is that he meets um, the titular Venus on a half shell, uh, who is a robot woman named Schwarktap, which is an anagram of patchwork. patchwork. Yeah, a lot of the names are either anagrams or like a German word that's mm-hmm. misspelled or something like that. Right, or pseudo anagrams. Yeah, <laughs> where he it sounds like they rearranged the letters, but they didn't really. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so she becomes his uh, lover, and it's about their uh, their adventures going around the world together and the, the universe. The universe, yeah, the universe. Um, she she ends up. She's actually they more or less flat out say she's smarter than him, and she knows a lot more than he and actually figures things out way before he does. Mm. But she never wants to say it because she doesn't want to bruise his ego. Well, basically. she was designed for a specific purpose to please, mm-hmm. you know, the, uh, her master basically. Right. But then she got a bump on her head and she was able to get to she, free herself. Right. Um, but she's designed to sort of want to be a people pleaser basically. Right. Yeah. She's, she, she developed free will. She had a, a master who, you know, she was there. One of many androids who were serving this one solipsistic uh, society where everyone had androids and, uh, and they would say, oh yeah, we love you master. You're great. But the master got, just got angrier and angrier because he knew they were just programmed to say that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, but he couldn't bear to deprogram them because he knew they'd probably hate him once he did that. And she got accidentally damaged. So she was able to develop free will and get away from him basically. But she's still, yeah, she's basically trying to keep Simon happy. But they do actually love each other uh, in 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 a way. But they, but you know, when they spend centuries together, they end up, uh, a- including at one point, being in prison for like three hundred years. Yeah. In a uh, in a uh, society where basically everyone ends up going to jail in that yeah, entire society. Yeah, except the president. Except the president. And then the president's uh, <laughs> uh, lineage. So just the president is the only person not in jail. But it, it describes the society as running pretty well from that point on because <laughs> yeah. everybody's in you know in jail right or working for the purpose of you know right jail or yeah yeah or 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 <laughs> yeah basically the entire society is now a prison basically yeah. uh and then what but he actually gets out through a loophole at that point uh and then busts her out and they take off again but at that point they're kind of sick of each other because they've literally spent like several centuries in a small cell mm. uh, <laughs> with eventually other families who move in yeah. and stuff so who have affairs and things with yeah. each other and yeah it's all a big mess yes and but and the main thing is he's spending the 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 uh, story searching for there's this uh, race uh called the oh god do we ha- do we have I, their name I wrote down most of the races uh one second uh which ones the ancient race that built the towers oh uh the uh, uh Glaren Galf 
Glower and Gauff. Okay. Glower and Gauff. Okay. Okay. And they were they were the uh, yeah the they they're, they they're giant cockroaches. Right. They built and ancient towers that are on basically every planet in the universe except, except Earth. Earth because uh, they. Uh, what was the reason again? Well, originally they said it, the joke was they didn't find that system to have much potential and didn't yeah. think it was going to be very interesting. But then later he said, no, we just didn't get around to it, basically. Oh, and it turns out these are the oldest beings in the universe. They were created by God. Right. Uh, well, dire- t- th- their their progenitor was created by God. He was yeah. one of the few exist remaining uh, beings that Yeah, yeah, existed. but their, their species was created directly by God. Mm-hmm. And then they traveled to other planets and their uh, germs and feces cause life on those planets to form right so they know he know he once you know he starts to realize that's the you know that's the person he can go to because they their 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 oldest member knew god personally he was created yeah. by god uh so that's the climax of the book is him finding that one ancient we're skipping name. ahead a bit yeah uh quite yeah. a bit well i mean it's it's a series of uh anecdotes and, yeah. and stories i liked uh the section that's set on the uh the blimp planet right yes or um the the females are uh, giant pyramids mm-hmm. uh, who just graze on grass, and the males are sort of blimps mm-hmm. who attach themselves to the females at night to get food and sex. Right, and uh, he sort of um, he causes the uh, uh, sort of gender equality or an attempt at gender equality in the in the yeah. uh, by um, encouraging the uh, the the uh, females to ask to be you know, taken on flights and things, but it causes problems uh, because they can't carry them and the females aren't grazing anymore and all this. Mm-hmm. So he suggests that uh, they um, make it... And it, the the society is monogamous, even though they cheat on each other all the time, but they're forwardly monogamous. But he suggests that they go to uh, two males for every female so they can carry them easier. Mm-hmm. And uh, he gets chased off and referred to as a sodomite. Yeah, for for generations afterwards, yeah. they keep calling him Simon the Sodomite. He gets chased off the planet with fury by the, the yeah. once he suggests that, and then uh, he tries to meet this other great pilgrim on a planet where everyone has tails. Uh, he and, gets one surgically attached because right. he's forced to. Because yeah. yeah, which is funny because it's kind of a libertarian planet where everyone is supposed to have the absolute amount of free will they can, and if anyone doesn't like it, they can go to the wild zone. Yeah, uh, and they said so. Then we don't have to build prisons. We don't have to build. Uh, we don't have to have police or anything because anyone who disagrees with our society just goes to the wild zone to live as they like. And sometimes like, and we've got we've built a wall to keep them to protect ourselves. And sometimes like, how many people do you have protecting the wall? Uh, three hundred thousand. It's like. Yeah, yeah. So okay. it would have been like they save money on jailers, but then have more people guarding the wall than they would have right. jailers. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, he goes kind of on a quest. He's actually fighting with Chork Tap at that point. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, so she doesn't go with him, but he says, "I'm going to go and find." So he out goes this. to the holy man, who turns out to be a cannibal, right? With a sort of Nietzschean yeah. or like pseudo Nietzschean, you know, like right. nothing matters and yeah. or it's, nihilist it, rather yeah well he has he has the attitude that uh god he says i've found that god created uh the world just to amuse himself and he doesn't care and he he seems to get more enjoyment out of pain than pleasure because there's so much more of pain than there is of pleasure and so much of hatred than there is of love so i try to make get, put on a good show and anyone who comes here i tell them this and then i kill them and simon's here's that and he's like you know yeah but i've read this theory in a million books this is not insightful at all you're yeah. an extremely boring person basically yeah. so but he does get his eye eaten yeah he gets he gets well, he gets an axe oh, in the sorry, eye yeah, yeah right yeah no the the his uh, he has a pet owl as well named athena as yeah. well as anubis and the uh, anubis and athena come to his rescue and Anu, uh, athena rips out the the guy's eye i believe um or uh, he, he has a servant as well yeah, who axes his eye and then Mm-hmm. Athena saves him. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. But yes, yeah, so he he has a bunch of the 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 details of the plot's narrow scrapes are not that important because mm-hmm. it's all absurdist, of course, yeah. and everything's kind of ridiculous. I actually thought um, uh, Chork Tap was going to save him. I thought she would come flying in and say, because yeah. that that would be, that would have been the obvious thing to do. But he kind of saves he more or less saves himself, and then gets Chork Tap to take him off the planet at that point. So um, anyway, just a series of and then there's also the idea that. Um, 
if you travel fast in the speed of light, you can go something like 69,000 times fast in the speed it of light. It was 69 specifically. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of sex in this book, and a lot of it is fairly juvenile. Yeah, I well, I, th- I think the joke was that uh, Kilgore Trout was writing for pornographic magazines. So, right. So th- a lot of that. That was intentional. Right. But reading uh, The Purple Wage afterwards, mm-hmm. nah, it's probably Farmer. Well, no, it, no, you're right. It is, I think, the f- with the first time. I think it is tied oh, okay. into the fact. But it was also just the 60s. Like, that yeah. was the thing when you were writing, you know, uh, absurdist, uh, shocking literature, which he actually, uh, he parodized. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, in uh, Vonnegut's novel, God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, uh, Rose, Mr. Rosewater, who's this philanthropist who's always giving money to people and not really helping their lives out, he's trying to help everyone and he never helps anyone. Uh, but he gives he f- he finds this one brilliant poet I've forgotten his name, who uh, he's like, oh, you've got this the most brilliant. You're you, nobody nobody's heard of you. You're poor. You're broke. But you're such a brilliant writer. I'm gonna write you a check right now for thousands of dollars so you can continue to do what you want. And the guy's like, oh my God, what do you want me to write about? He's like, no, 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 you write whatever you want. I'm not going to tell you what to write about. And the guy breaks down crying and flees and has a whole... Anyway, and he he eventually sends him a manuscript and Mr. Rosewater's completely uh, completely forgotten about this guy and doesn't remember who he is at all because you inspired me so I'm going to write these daring truths that society doesn't want to hear <laughs> and and inside and immediately it's a, just a bunch of sex scenes basically <laughs> <laughs> and uh, ah Vonnegut so th- that reminds me I think that's kind of parodying uh, oh, okay. the way writers were in the 60s they were all like I haven't read Rosewater I've read a, f- a few Vonnegut's but uh, not that yeah. one well I th- but I think it's general because Rosewater was written in 65 or thereabouts mm-hmm. and I think that's just that was literature at the time we just talked about you know the new wave of literature and the way literature had shifted up yeah. but a lot of it was just we can write about sex now man <laughs> and about how crazy the world is man and it was all hippie kind of yeah. writing basically and uh, so that has this was written in uh, 75 73 75 I believe it was 4 okay 74 um, but uh, <laughs> fell on either end of that one uh, but um, yeah he he, uh, he wrote about yeah, it's it's got that spirit in the water. Now mm-hmm. it's a co- it's actually very funny. I would. Oh, say. I liked it a lot. Actually, it was yeah, it was interesting. And a lot of the uh, the alien species were interesting and right. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, and the there are the wheeled alien species oh, yeah, as well, yeah. which are kind of fun. They're always. They, just... I I had trouble picturing them, but yeah, they're aliens that are just wheels, and they they um they just travel on this barren planet. Yeah. Um and. Uh, there's a leader in every pack, and when you die, you become the leader in your, of your own pack, and yeah, uh, you just continue rolling forever, and you don't get flat tires or yeah. whatever. Yeah, if anyone gets a flat tire, they're left by the wayside yeah. to die. It's obviously kind of a metaphor for, you know, 80s style. You know, no, you got to keep going, man. You got to keep reaching for the brass ring. To, mm-hmm. You know, they're all commentaries on yeah. human society in different ways, of course. As I say, it's it's kind of Jonathan Swift yeah. um, kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I, I mentioned Kurt Vonnegut earlier, just, uh, you know, he's, like I say, he wrote, um, Breakfast of Champions and he wrote, uh, Slaughterhouse Five, probably his best known work is Slaughterhouse Five. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like I say, Kurt, Va- uh, Kilgore Trout was a character who Vonnegut created, uh, uh, Vonnegut literally said this at one point, um, uh, it, it's it's a lot more fun to just describe a story in a few paragraphs, <laughs> and then to have to actually write the whole story. Oh yeah, Farmer was uh, actually talked about this in one of the forwards or afterwards. There were a lot of supplementary material in this yeah. book, but uh, uh, there was there was a writer who just did a um, I can't remember who. This is terrible, but uh, who just did a, an entire book of summaries of other of fictional books that didn't exist. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was that was yeah. The, probably yeah. inspired by uh, by Vonnegut and mm-hmm. Trout. But yeah, Trout Trout exists. Trout is uh, Vonnegut's. By the way, uh, he's a, a reportedly a parody of Theodore Sturgeon. Hence the fish yeah. title in their name. Uh, but of course, he also kind of became Vonnegut himself as the series went on. Um, and Vonnegut and Sturgeon were friends, apparently. And mm-hmm. it's true. Sturgeon was. Um, he doesn't write anything like Trout, I would say. But he definitely has some similarities he's kind of an absurdist he again he wasn't afraid to write about sex and shock and stuff he has a very humanist impulse and i mean Vonnegut is famously a very humanist writer as well but sturgeon was very 
he was a pretty uplifting writer in general, I would say. Um, when he created Trout, Sturgeon hadn't really gotten a successful career, but he ended up becoming uh, fairly successful within the science fiction uh, field. But anyway, uh, it's Trout exists basically in Vonnegut's stories to uh, to provide little parentheticals about different stories and and uh, little short stories within the larger short story. Um, apparently, he is, I believe his last appearance was in Timequake, yep, which you've I read, read that one. and yeah. I have not read. It's been a while, but yeah, a lot of it's, a lot of it's very uh, autobiographical. I mean, literally about Vonnegut. Oh, right. But really? it, it, he also works Trout into there quite a bit. Right. Have you read Breakfast of Champions? Yeah. Yeah. Because Breakfast of Champions is kind of crucial because he basically... Uh, Kilgore Trout is one of the main characters, and yeah. it's it, it's about Kilgore Trout, uh, a, a guy named Wayne uh, Dwayne Hoover, uh, Dwayne Hoover, excuse me, um, ends up uh, reading one of his books, and he was kind of breaking down, and the, oh yeah, the book was him. about uh, was uh, written from the point of view of God talking to the only sentient being in the universe, and everybody else was a machine. Right, the Trout book was. Yeah, yeah the Trout book was. So uh, that's basically the NPC meme now. Yeah, if we're going to get into politics. My God, yes. Well, it was. I mean, in this, in the book, the idea is that Hoover is breaking down. You know, his marriage is falling apart. He's just angry at the world and everything. And when he reads that book, it tips him over the edge into like, actually a, a violent rampage. A violent where rampage. He, he beats up his son and right. And and a lot of he yeah a, a lot of people, of people but his son included yeah and he, and and uh, that was Vonnegut basically going you know we writers we try to influence the world we try to put out good things but we can write things that can influence people in horrible ways and cause you know horrible problems and uh, so at the end of the book literally Kurt Vonnegut writes himself meeting Kilgore Trout and saying look I've been writing about you for a couple decades now uh, I'm going to give you the the nicest thing. A, a writer can give to his creation and I'm going to set you free. Uh, so he basically says, you have free will, you can do whatever you want now. And I think he said, all I'm going to say is you'll have some more success from now on. You'll have a bit more uh, popularity, but that's all I can do for you. Um, and then he continued to appear in his books too, which is yeah. kind of interesting. But I believe that's why in Time Quake, which is about uh, a period, people hit a... A, a 10-year period where uh, basically time repeats itself and people have to live through their lives again. Right. And without any control over it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in that story, uh, Trout actually writes a uh, memoir about the time quake that becomes quite popular. Right. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, I, again, I haven't read it, but I've heard about it. Uh, Trout is, the, once the time quake ends, suddenly everyone's, uh, basically, they've been operating on remote control for like 10 years. So they don't know how to oh, yeah, use their own free crash will. and stuff. Yeah. They don't know how to use their own free will. And Trout's the only one who comes out of that going, okay, free will. And he tries to yeah. save everyone's life and everything, basically. So, because he's, again, he was granted true free will by God, aka Kurt Vonnegut. Okay. I didn't make that connection, <laughs> I, but yeah, that. Yeah. I believe that was the idea there. But um, you, you mentioned that uh, um, Trout had different birth dates right. in different stories. And that, that goes to a lot of. I guess we're just talking about Vonnegut now, but yeah. uh, say uh, Tralfamador, which is a planet that appears in a number of Vonnegut stories, Some, but it's always sort of mutually exclusive ways. Uh, the most famous example, of course, is uh, uh, Slaughterhouse-5, where mm -hmm. they're uh, green sort of plungers with a hand on top right. and uh, an eye in the hand, mm -hmm. and they see all of time at once, so they experience time nonlinearly, right. and um, they can see the whole of the universe stretched out. Right. Uh, from beginning to end. Um, and they're very fatalistic because because of that. Right. Yeah, that's right. They can see everything that's going to happen and they don't have any, again, they don't have any control over their yeah. actions because they know what's going to happen from yeah. beginning to end. They, they end up con destroying the universe at the end. Right. Or not at the end of the book, but they know that they're going to be destroying the universe through an accident. So. Right. In like a million years yeah. or something. Yeah. Um, well, how are the Tralfalmadorians? Are they described differently in another book? Yeah, in Sirens of Titan. Yes. Um, the uh, the Martian spaceships are based off of Tralfalmadorian design. Okay. That's uh, room for uh, this. I don't want to describe the whole plot of the book, but uh, mm -hmm. in this, they're machines. They're robots with uh, three legs, uh, three eyes, and a, uh, a skin-like covering that they can take off that looks like a uh, tangerine peel. Okay. And uh, they they don't experience time that way. They seem to experience they're immortal, but uh, uh, and they they the history is sort of it doesn't one could say that one species built the other because they're robots. Okay, but that doesn't work within the uh, story of of uh, Sirens of Titan where right. all their 
their home planet is just robots and the species that built them died out long ago. Right. So yeah. they all these so he uses the word and it comes up in other books and usually as a uh hypothetical or I think in Rosewater Wikipedia said it was uh, hypothetical in Rosewater. Mm-hmm. Like he says hypothetically there's this planet out there called Tralfamador. Oh, okay. Or something like that. Yeah. And it's Well, mentioned... Trout wrote about the Tralfamadorians, if I'm not mistaken, oh, okay. but then they actually do exist in yeah. the world of um, Champions. So, uh, and uh, it's mentioned in Time Quake briefly. So it appears in other stories, but the main two are Slaughterhouse 5 and Sirens of Titan, mm-hmm. but they don't fit together that, like, they don't work together. Right. So it's just a word that Vonnegut liked. Yeah. There's no, there's no co- true continuity. And in fact, uh, Farmer in one of the forewords to uh, Venus on a Half Shell uh, is basically works very hard to assemble a biography of Kilgore Trout the way he does with various other characters. Uh, and of course, it's impossible because his, uh, his, uh, the biographical details change very much from book to book. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, you know, what year he was born in, uh, what year he's even going to die, uh, whether he has a child or not. He supposedly in one book has a book as a child named Leon Trotsky Trout, uh, who is never mentioned in any of the other books. Which book was that? Uh, that is in Galapagos, I believe. Okay. It's okay. from his viewpoint of, uh, Leon Trotsky Trout. Oh, okay. Um, but again, he doesn't show up in any of the other stories. And uh, it's not clear, you know, whether that's anything. Um, anyway, uh, but yeah, it's, 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 you know, Vonnegut is cheerfully doing the Simpsons thing of whatever is useful I'm gonna yeah. be, as a joke, whereas Farmer's the exact opposite. He's the yeah. kind of guy who has to have everything fall into a... He did this for uh, Tarzan's son, Korak. He wrote an essay in which he actually tried to really nail down when Korak was born, how old he was, based on the clues from the stories, which don't necessarily line up that clearly. Yeah. He's like, well, we can ignore this because the author was exaggerating. He does a lot yeah. of that kind of thing, which is, is... I mean, and of course, it's a fun intellectual thing, I don't think Farmer was sitting there getting really mad that he couldn't make the, the yeah. details fit. Um, but oh, you know. I do that all the time when I mix stories together into one universe. Right. Yeah. Uh, you have to ignore. You have to ignore certain things because, yeah. uh, especially by different authors. Like if you're doing a League of Extraordinary Gentlemen sort of thing. Yeah. Which Farmer was doing. Right. Um, you have to ignore certain details in order to. Yeah. To sort of just make things fit together in a way that. Yeah, that makes sort sense. of coherent. Yeah, exactly, and uh, which is which is fine. And again, I don't again, I don't think Farmer was, <laughs> but he, you can see Farmer is the kind of guy he would he can write this giant essay trying to lock down all the details of a fictional universe where you know you can argue. Okay, you're, you're you may be going a little too far there. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> I like that sort of thing, but yeah, <laughs> Philip. Um, but you mentioned Sirens of Titan, and actually, that's actually interesting because Kilgore, Tr- of course, Kilgore Trout in all of Vonnegut's novels and Sirens of Titan is the pulpiest novel he's, he's ever written. He's not in that though. Uh, no, he's not. But Sirens of Titan uh, is probably the pulpiest novel that Vonnegut ever wrote. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very much about, you know, it's got, his other stories are sort of absurdist. They have a claim to being, you know, more literary, but Sirens of Titan is very much a space adventure type of story where he goes around the, uh, the solar system. Yeah, um, it's got philosophical stuff in it. But, oh yeah, it, yeah, it's it's a good, it's a great book. It's well written and everything like that. But it just show you how Vonnegut, because if you've ever read some of Vonnegut's short fiction, um, wh- well, at least Welcome to the Monkey House, which was mostly written around the time of Sirens of Titan, I believe, um, and it's. Uh, you know, it, it's much more he was writing short science fiction stories for the science fiction market. And it feels a little less like the Vonnegut we come to know later mm. uh, because it's much more about concepts in the way he describes Kilgore Trout's stories being. He, he, he in, in especially in God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, he describes Trout's novels as being, oh, they're these great ideas, but he wasn't a great writer. Yeah. And that's, that's he's sort of the stand-in for all of science fiction for, uh, for Trout and Vonnegut, for Vonnegut. Just that's what... Uh, that's what science fiction is. It's all these great ideas that people and people don't take this genre very seriously mm-hmm. because it's badly written. It's often silly. It's got lots. It's juvenile and, por- and literally making it pornographic. In the case of Kilgore Trout's uh, thing, that's the whole point. Is Kilgore Trout's books are never in print. They're only found in like. Uh, porno bookstores and yep. things like that. He, he's never taken seriously, but he feels there's some fundamental interesting truth buried in there. Um, and that's just interesting because I like this whole way that uh, there's this very blurry line between pulp and, quote, literature sometimes. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, so back to Venus on a half shell because we didn't discuss the ending. Right. Yes. Should we spoil it? Or? Yeah, we're okay. gonna sp- we're going to spoil the ending of Venus on a half shell if you guys <laughs> want to hear it. It. I would recommend the book. So yeah, it's a good check book. it out. Um, so. but um, yeah, basically, uh, he asked God, or he asked the guy who had known God, mm-hmm. the uh, the co- giant cockroach. Yeah. You know, why would God do all this if he knew there was all going to be all this suffering and, you know just horribleness in the universe and the answer is why not yep that's it that's That's how the the book book. ends yeah (laughs) why not it was the idea that god probably erased his and it was it wasn't that god abandoned us it was that god forgot about us because uh he deliberately forgot about us well he uh he occasionally erases his omniscience Mm -hmm. to keep things from getting boring right and he obviously just went off and created another universe and forgot us right. at some point. On it, you know, like he erased his. Yeah, he because he, he had promised he'd come back, but then he forgot about us. Right, he deliberately erased his memory uh, so that because if he knew everything, everything just becomes incredibly boring and terrible. So he he erased his memory of us for that reason. But he'll he'll get back to us someday, possibly at the end of the universe. Basically, yeah. <laughs> There's also a, a funny idea in the in the books. The you were. Getting to this earlier, I think the sixty-nine drives it mm-hmm. goes sixty-nine times the speed of light. Yes, they're caused. Uh, it's uh, actually draining the the sentient suns from another universe. Right. So the faster you go, the louder the screaming is. Right. And then by the end of the book, uh, they they find they've drained the last of the sentient suns, so nobody can do space travel anymore. Yeah. So, so he's stuck so, with yeah the, the cockroach uh, people at the end. Yeah, the Gorn Gulfs or sorry. whatever. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> very hard to pronounce their name. It's apparently a German word or something. Yeah, it's a riff on a German yeah. word. Anyway. So, uh, yeah, it's, it is it is a very interesting novel for that regard. And like like I say, it, it it's hard not to notice because it's a, the last Earthling looking for the life, the universe, and everything. Uh, the parallel to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, all, it, it's, it's, it's just occupies a really interesting intersection between all these different uh, aspects of pulp and literature, of multiple different writers, humor and seriousness. Um, it seems actually weirdly influential, even though you barely hear about it nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, and it's very short. It's very short. It's a quick read. Uh, I would say, check it out if you're interested. Me too. Um, and, uh, Philip, uh, Jose Farmer is generally a good writer as well. And of course, Kurt Vonnegut was a, one of the literary ti- Titans, not the sirens, but the Titans <laughs> of our time. So I think we'll uh, we'll be wrapping it up here. This podcast was conceived and hosted by Philip Rice and Adam Prosser, the protagonists of Evelyn Korn's Pulitzer Prize winning 2034 novel, Who Are Those Guys? It was produced by Alex Ross, the villain of the iconic Two-Fisted Podcaster series of short stories. And the theme song was written by Jack Furick, a minor character in Jonathan Swift Summers' comic opera, Too Old to Rock and Roll, Too Young to Die. If you've enjoyed this, please check out our Patreon. Subscribers get to listen to the show a week early. Plus, you get lots of other neat stuff, including our comics and art. Uh, the Patreons are, again, Adam Prosser and Philip Rice at patreon.com. Those and our Facebook page and Instagram are linked to at neversleepsnetwork.com slash series slash what dash mad dash universe. And you can subscribe to our RSS feed there as well. So, good night to all you characters out there, real and fictional, and may you find your authors someday. 